So, have you ever stumbled upon your input code and noticed there were a couple of bugs, but you don't know how to fix them? I'm going to be talking about how I fixed a bunch of bugs that I found on my input function. One will look at this code and say, yeah, it's fine, it's checking for inputs and stuff. But here, there is a bunch of bugs happening here, here, and also for other things, because we are not checking if the input that called this function is actually the one we want. And I also implement a state machine to make sure that my inputs are being processed the way that I want. So there are different ways to detect inputs and there are different functions you can use it. So let's talk about this and I'm going to show you a lot of nice tips dealing with inputs inside Gideo. Play interface code. So being this, the code for the input section, well, a couple of things are wrong. The first one I'm going to point out is these bunches of ifs here. Because they are ifs and they don't have another sequence like else or elif, every if is executed independently, so every if could be run at the same time. So this was something that I wanted at that time as prototyping the code. But now we need to address this. And also something I want to address is that everything is using input here. So input has its own uses, but the correct use here for input is just this guy here. So this is one of the common ways you do to check for the input here. Now the rest here is actually pretty wrong. So we need to address this and see how we can fix this. So right here we have the case of the old code, which was this one that I had, and the new code, which is this guy on the right here. So I have hidden some parts of the code which are not relevant for this tutorial. But the important part here that you should notice is that I am no longer using only ifs. Now there is a sequence, so when you use a leaf here, one of these four ifs can be executed, but only one based on the input call. Because on this case here, every if is checked separately. Here, if one of those conditions in the downwards order is executed, and it's just going to use one of them. So on this case, only one of these are being selected and here all of those could be either false or true. You may notice that I'm using a simple machine state here and I'm going to cover a little bit about on this video as well. So basically we are matching a variable here, which is an integer, and we are going to ask it if it is on a current state and we're gonna give some code here for it to run. So here I basically have divided my interface code, the input section of it, to be different depending on the modes that I wanted. So here I have created a mode for drag ball selection, for building mode, formation path and idle. And this potentially can be expanded however you like. So the idea here is that based on the states that the interface is on its input state, I'm going to change how the inputs are processed. If you are on an idle state, you're going to have a couple of possibilities. If you are on drag box selection, the inputs now will do different things. And that is the same inputs. That's the magic of it. We're going to change the behavior of the inputs based on an input state variable. And this variable is defined as a enumeration, which is an integer. So that's pretty cool stuff. So enumerations are useful because you're creating a list of constants, which can be referenced like strings, but in actuality behind the scenes they are working as integers. So they they are more performance than using strings for your code. So whenever you can, use enumeration instead of strings. So enumerations are pretty much useful and you can combine them in with using match. So match statements is an alternative if you don't like to use a bunch of ifs. If you're matching input states, so the input states dot idle, if you remember, it was zero is the same thing as checking if the input state is equal to zero, whereas it's more human readable. But you can see that with match, you can do a lot more complex stuff. These are from the documentation. If you want to learn more, you can read them from there. To combine the input states with the state variable being an integer and a match, you can have a state machine. So you can execute code depending on the state that you are in. So you're going to define an enumeration for the states you want. And this is considered as integers. So this is going to be 0, 1, 2 and 3. But on the script code, you can actually type as a text. But this is not a string. It's actually an integer behind the scenes. And here is going to be our input states. 
So whenever you want some behavior to happen based on which state the input state is, you can do a match. So match is almost the same thing as doing this right here. So as you can see here, we are matching the input state and we're checking if it is the input state's idle, which basically means we are checking if the input state is equal to zero because idle is zero. Because we do not have defined an integer here, so it's calculated as zero. Date machines are very useful. We're going to use to filter the inputs as we want. So here we are checking for the input state which is an integer and we're checking if it is on idle then we're going to do some stuff if it is on drag box selection mode then we're going to do some stuff if it is on building mode or formation path this thing is the same as this one down here which basically you are matching as a integer values the difference here however is if you change the order here it doesn't matter because it's going to be called from the names of it. So if you put idle here on the front, idle is going to become one. But the code, you don't have to change it. Well, let's talk about var set get. So you can call functions whenever you are changing variables. Pretty useful because you can pretty much change the how the variables are being changed or fetched. Whenever you set the variable to a new value, you can call this whatever you want. So this is basically how set get works. This is the default behavior. So if you are used to setting variables, this is the way it currently is. So when you define a variable, you're basically doing this as well here. Whenever you set the variable to a new thing, it's going to be assigned. And whenever you want to be returned, it's going to return that variable. But you can change the behavior with set get, And this works for any variable and any type of variable. So here I just give an example of setting the value Instead of actually changing the variable, we're going to simply print here, haha. What's the default behavior for variables? So let's say you just define it and you want to behave as a normal variable. When you're using set get, this is the basic structure you have to type. And here's the case with an input state. So here is actually trying to use the state machine as well. You can see here that we have a code to debug the state machine which are going to show on the next slide here you have a code that is going to exit the new state so basically you're saying if we change the state so here's the new state this is the exit state code and then this part here is the new state codes and here's actually the variable assign so whenever you change the input state you're going to first print the debug you can also run some functions to be called an exit of the state. You're going to assign the variable to be the new value and you're going to assign code for the new state. You're going to call all of this structure just by running this here. Whenever you change the set, it's going to run the set and whenever you want it return, it's going to run the get part. Oh, very useful stuff. So here the idea is you can print the state you are coming from to the next one easily with doing the set get here so whenever you change the value you can print it which was the state before and what it is the next state being set this is some pretty useful stuff you can use to debug your state machine to make sure they are transitioning correctly between states here we are matching the state the new value we are going to assign to the state so this is like an exit state code or a enter for the new value and an exit for the older value. So here is, we can say that once you exit this state, we can run a, a some type of code. Then we are going to change the variable and we can also assign a new function to whenever you set the state. So here is a debug function. Here is an exit state code. Here is where you are going to set the variable to the new value and here is an enter code. So if you choose to do it this way, if you are exiting the current input state, this is the code that you want to execute because you are exiting that state. And this is the code that you want to execute once you enter a new state. And this is the actual state change. So instead of actually calling it here with a new value, you can call it with a function. And later you can define the behaviors you want whenever you are exiting that state or when you are entering a new state. You can see here that it's going to be pretty neatly organized. So here we are using the enumerations. This is a lot more human readable than using just integer numbers. Putting in context to use the current input thing we are doing, but this can be pretty much applied to anything you want. And you can see how this is useful. Whenever you are 
Exiting in state or whenever you are entering a new state, you can run functions based on setting a new state to the input state. So pretty useful stuff here. So using set get on this occasion would help us in changing some states. So let's say that from the state of idle to the drag box selection mode, you want something to happen once you exit the input state idle and once you enter the input state drag box selection. Using set get, you can run functions whenever you switch them. And this is very useful if you are doing AI work because once you exit a state, you can run the code that you want. And once you enter a new state, you can execute some other code. And that is some pretty nifty stuff that can help you in transition between the input states. And you can notice something here as well. You can see that I have input is action pressed. So input here is the singleton. So we are checking for inputs being currently pressed. And here I'm actually checking for the input event if it is being released. So there's a big difference between using inputs and using the input events that the input function returns. So I'm going to talk about this as well, because there's a lot of confusion about inputs and input events, which are quite different. Well, let's talk about input detection differences. So there's a lot of different ways you can detect inputs. This is from the documentation. You can see here is using the events and later is using the inputs. Now here's the difference. This function is going to call every time there is an input and it can be the mouse. It can be the keyboard. It can be whatever this function is being called for every input always. This function here is going to be called whenever there is, there is an input that did not got consumed, did not got used. So there are a lot of ways you can consume inputs to not propagate to this function. But this function is basically saying if the input passed it through the nodes and did not get used, it's going to call unhandled inputs. And there is a special order of execution, which you can see on the documentation as well. The physics process, it's called every physics frame, which usually is 60 FPS. You can change this, but it usually tends to break a lot of things. So usually it's a constant delta that's going to get run for the physics frame. So this function is going to be called for every physics frame. So that is why sometimes when you change the code from input to physics, it usually fixes the bugs because input is being called multiple times on the same frame and it's going to run your code because of this. So process functions are usually run a lot more than the physics process unless you're using vsync. So that's the difference there. And you can make a test by just printing information from process and disable vsync. You're going to see a much more print amount than the physics process because the physics process is locked to a certain amount to calculate properly the physics. So process functions is a lot more expensive than physics process usually and is also a lot more responsive. So keep that in mind. So also something quite interesting is you have the function input that you can put events in. This function input is going to be called every time for every input. And here is where the confusion happens because sometimes is that multiple inputs are being called for the same frame. And usually people do only this, which is only check if on the input singleton, if the if that input is being pressed. So well, basically what happens is you're going to call this function twice because there's two inputs on the single frame, one from the mouse moving and one for the release of the mouse. And because this function is checking if the player pressed the this action, it's going to run through twice. And the solution for this is for you to check if the input that called this function, which is the input event, if it is being pressed, then you can check if the input that called this function is the action that you wanted to check and execute the code properly. So also something quite interesting is that the input function has is action released, is action just released. And you can see the documentation on that. But the input event itself only have is action released. It does not have is action just released. So let's see how you can use this input event to correctly detect the inputs. So here's the question. If I want to use the input function, which of these options would be the correct one to use for a input is action just release? So the first option uses the input singleton and the second option uses the input event. So actually both options are the wrong answers. So the problem with the input function here on this case is that input can be called multiple times per frame. 
and this is going to run multiple instances of this line of code here. And the second option is also wrong because is action just release does not exist on the input event, which is a function from the singleton input. So the correct way for you to do this is to actually use the input event is action released. So this actually will be the correct way for you to do it. So what benefits from this one have is that even if you try to call this multiple times, it's going to safe check this because here we are checking if the input they call the input function is being released. So we're going to check if the input that match this action released. So even if multiple inputs are being called, we're going to check if the input event they call the input function is the one which is being released. So this is basically the correct way that you should do is action release. Now, I don't think I can think of an instance where you want multiple instances of this code being run, where if you pressed the you pressed two inputs at the same time, you want this code to run twice. I don't think that's the case. So you should be mostly if you are using the input function and you want to check if a key is being released you pretty much should use is action release and remember that is not is action just release which is an input function so this does not exist for input events is simple is action released so finally i've ever everything i have talked about you can see how it was a useful change so now that i have reformatted my inputs it no longer are going to occur the bugs with multiple inputs being called through the input function and because we are checking on the same frame for the same input, multiple conditions here are going to be true and are going to execute code a bunch of times. Whereas here we have a more precise control. One, because we are putting some logic behind the input states we are in. So I don't want to process anything regarding the drag box selection code when you are in the input state idle. I want to process other things. And also there's not a single chance of that bug happening because here we are checking when the action being released being the input events you use here input it can it can be the case that is going to run multiple times but because we are checking if that input they call the function input is the action we wanted then if even if multiple inputs are being run because we are checking what input event called this function then we're going to basically filter out any unwanted inputs whereas if you use only input it's going to ask globally if that input is being pressed which could be true in a single frame so that's the difference between using inputs and the input events so my bug was more noticeable because it was the selection thing but if you have any other games that you are worrying about why it's being called multiple times, most likely it's because you are using the input singleton instead of checking for the input event on the case that the action is being released. Because action being pressed, then it's safe to use the input function. So you can see how by implementing a state input for the inputs and by using input events, you can fix a bunch of bugs and control precisely what the player is doing inside your game. So there's a clear difference between using the inputs normally and the input events.